Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for the next in our Library Fest events. We hope you're enjoying them so far. Uh, today we're joined by Liz Carlton. Liz works at the National Library of Scotland in our Access Department and has a degree in History and a postgraduate degree in Conflict Archaeology and Heritage from the University of Glasgow. Before beginning work at the Library, she worked for two heritage organisations, the National Trust for Scotland and Historic Scotland. She's also worked as an archaeologist in England. During her master's year she was involved in the Waterloo Uncovered Veterans Dig at Waterloo Battlefield in Belgium and last year was involved in the NTS evac excavation sorry, beg your pardon, at Glen Shields Battlefield in Kintail. So without further ado let's welcome Liz. Thank you. Thank you Joe. I'll just share my screen now. Okay. Hi folks, I um, hope you're all doing well today and many thanks for attending this wee talk of mine. Um, I wanted to do a session here which covers both my academic interests and my workplace and so this uh, talk is based off a mixture of uh, some research I did uh, for my conflict archaeology master's degree uh, at Glasgow University and a love for the written word since I also work for the library as uh, Joe just said. Um, so for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to take a look at how uh, we can use different types of literature to get a better understanding um, of the important role terrain has played in a number of Scottish battles. Studying historical texts and literature is a standard part of the preliminary death-based analyses routinely undertaken by archaeologists and military historians when uh, researching conflict sites. Um, and text can lead archaeologists to locations in the battlefield where physical evidence uh, of the battle can be found and they, it can also illustrate the events which took place in the conflict environment. So for this talk I've chosen to talk about a few battles which took place on Scottish soil but I've also chosen two battles involving the Scots on English soil as well. Now these battles are of course still important in Scotland's history so I think they count as Scottish battles, even if they were fought just across the border in England. So, if I just move on. So, how do I get the uh, PowerPoint presentation to move along? So, if you just click on your PowerPoint, um, Liz. Yeah. It oh, should. Yeah, it's done it. Thank you very much. All right. Cheers. Okay. Um, so to begin to explore the importance topography has in warfare, we can firstly look to the uh, theoretical text from some of our most influential military philosophers. So the Art of War Treatise by the Chinese general Sun Tzu from around the 5th century BC and the On War Text from the Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz from 1832 can offer some really interesting insights into how uh, universal strategic thought on battlefield topography really is especially for people like me now who have no prior military experience. Um, even though some of these famous texts are not Scottish, nor are they contemporary to any of the battles we'll be looking at, they can really help us structure our minds around how commanders have taken advantage of, and in some cases underestimated the terrain. So we shall uh, refer back to these the uh, theories throughout this presentation just as a guide whilst discussing contemporary texts of these battles as well. So we're going to firstly look at Sun Tzu's treatise and how it demonstrates what I'm talking about here, as his text has a whole section on uh, terrain, and he formed a list of six types of ground, which are listed on this uh, slide just here, that an army has to take into consideration when designing their plan of action on the battlefield. And he provides definitions and insights on how to press home the advantage when occupying each type of terrain. Now, Clausewitz also highlights the paramount importance of landscape in his writings as well, um, by stating that among civilised nations, combat uninfluenced by its surroundings and the nature of the ground is hardly conceivable. So Clausewitz uh, slightly differs to Sun Tzu, actually, in his, um, how he looks at the ground. He thinks that there are three main ways in which the ground plays a part in warfare. So these are, as you can see on the slide, um, as an obstacle to the approach, an impediment to visibility and also cover from fire. Um, all of the other, all the other properties can be traced back to these three. So Clausewitz, instead of identifying individual terrain types, he looks at how these terrain types cause three different situations. 
Now, with these factors in mind, we're going to uh, have a look at our first battle now. Now, Halyton Hill uh, takes place in 1333, just outside of Berwick upon Tweed, uh, during the Second Wars of Independence. And uh, the Second Wars of Independence is wherein Edward III of England intends to annex his territory by putting pressure on the Scots by supporting the throne's claimant, Edward Balliol. Now the battle uh, takes place between Sir Archibald Douglas um, for the Scottish army and Edward III of England um, for, for the English army on the 19th of July in 1333. And the contemporary texts we have uh, for the battle here are absolutely it's brilliant literature for understanding how much weight the terrain holds in the outcome. Now the best texts we have from the 14th century um, for this engagement are chronicles which are often written uh, by religious clerics. Now, depending on their allegiances, uh, certain details can be underplayed or over-exaggerated, just as our newspapers can do today. Uh, but this doesn't mean that they aren't useful, and they can still provide key details in their, report, in their reports that help our understandings. So the Scots they assembled the set, uh, themselves on the hill called the Witches Now, just north of the River Tweed, which runs through Berwick. Uh, the higher Halidon Hill was where three battles of dismounted English men-at-arms, flanked by wedges of English bowmen, uh, longbowmen, arranged themselves. And as we can see on this aerial photography from Google Maps that I very amateurly edited here, um, it's, you can just, it's just to give you a better idea of what the deployments look like. So the Scots battalions, um, they, they formed three shilchans or hedges of spears, and the Scottish heavy cavalry arranged themselves behind the spearmen. This information had been used before with Robert the Bruce successfully employing the tactic at Loudon Hill in 1307 and again at Bannockburn in 1314. And it had also been unsu unsuccessfully used the year before Halidon Hill at Duplin Moor by the Earl of Mar against Edward Balliol's forces as well. And Shiltron formations really depend on advan advantageous terrain and well-drilled soldiers. So for Halidon Hill, um, the Scottish written Winton Chronicle makes note of the fact that the Scots actually had not considered their terrain here. Now, I think this is partially true, as the Northern English Anonymal Chronicle says, and the Scots stood quietly and did not wish to fight against the King of England and his, for, um, and his forces, and this was because they did not want to move uh, from there until the River Tweed was at full flood tide, because then they well imagined that they might drive the King of England and his men into the River Tweed or into the sea to drown them. So it looks like here that the Scots did actually have a plan to use the wider terrain against the English by routing them back towards the river in order to drown their forces. But as Andrew de Winton um, points out, they seemingly didn't um, inspect their immediate ground conditions as he uh, continues that there was a marshy creek bed between them with steep rising ground on either side. They first had to go down the declivity and then climb up their enemies, but that they could not see beforehand. So from these texts, we can gather that the Scots did actually have a plan with regards to the uh, to, to with regards to taking advantage of the terrain. But as they descended down towards the foot of Halidon Hill and towards the higher ground the English were occupying, once they hit the boggy marsh, their momentum was lost, and at the very foot of, of Halidon Hill, they lost sight of the English forces and became a disorganised melee. Now this error in ground scouting, coupled with English arrow storms from their longbowmen, created a really tough blow for the Scots. And this battle really fits into Clausewitz's category as an impediment to visibility. And also Sun Tzu's idea of know the ground, know the natural conditions, and the victory can be total. And unfortunately for the Scots, that wasn't so here. Now for our second battle, we're going to skip ahead to 1513 and the Battle of Flodden. Now for a bit of background here, the battle is a direct result of an attempt by Henry, the, uh, Henry VIII to counter a threat made to the English by James IV's alliance with Louis XII of France. Following Henry's invasion of France in 1511, Louis sends military equipment, French army captains and money to James to improve and train a Scottish army. And in 1513, the Scottish army marches south, or, um, south of the border into Northumberland. Now there are texts which distinguish some details of James IV's defeat here at Flodden. Much like um, the battle at Halidon Hill, contemporary texts give us the best textual evidence uh, for understanding how King James's ideas of his surrounding strategic terrain were outmaneuvered by the English. 
So for Flodden, as well as chronicles, we can also look to documents such as state papers for illustrative reports of the battle's choreography. But this first excerpt here that I'm just about to read is the first printed account of Flodden, which is called The True Encounter of the Battle. And indeed, it speaks of an error made by the Scottish army's commander before the engagement. As it says, um, the said King of Scots did cause his tents to be taken up and keeping the heights of the mountain removed with his great power and pursuance of people out of the said forest towards Scotland. Now this refers uh, to the fact that James optimistically placed um, his uh, 30 to 40,000 strong army upon Flodden Hill, well in advance of the arrival of 26,000 English, and placed his heavy cannon artillery accordingly in earthworks, assuming that the English would array their troops to the base uh, of, of Flodden Hill to the south. In retaliation, the English lined up on Piper's Hill to the north and to the east of the River Till, causing the Scots to reform their lines, spanning across the slightly lower mile-long Brankston Hill. So the Scots had to redeploy their siege cannon as well, hurriedly, and struggled to move them over the, uh, over the ground due to them being so heavy. As a result, the guns fired at an angle which arced over the main body of the English divisions on Piper's Hill, whereas the lighter English artillery proved far more mobile and could punch through the ranks of the Scottish pikemen on the hill, depleting their numbers and morale even before their engagement with the English billhooks. Now, the English clerk, Brian Tuke, uh, wrote what happens next in his state report as well. He says that the hill, being so strengthened and defended by ordnance, that the assailants were obliged to wade through a certain marshy pass, leaving their guns in the rear. Now, Tuke here refers to when Scottish pikemen advance down, uh, down the hill and they hit a bog, which has since been geologically researched and attributed as a huge flaw in James's military tactics. Now this groundwater seepage zone that, uh, that is at the bottom of the hill, um, that's on the uh, geological diagram here, proved to be really hazardous to the Scottish right and centre as they advanced down Frankston Hill. Much like the earlier uh, Shiltron spear formation I mentioned earlier, James's pipe block required momentum, cohesiveness and discipline when approaching the enemy. And the creek bed on the right in the centre of Brankston Hill caused havoc with the unfortunately inexperienced and ill-drilled soldiers which scuppered any chance of a speedy approach up Piper's Hill towards the English, English longbows and bills. Now in contrast, uh, the Earl of Surrey's forces were situated upon the well-drained crest of the smaller incline. They were able to maintain order and steady footing in their defensive formation against the chaotic divisions of Scots who were brandishing 5.5 metre pikes, which could resultantly be chopped down to a pole during close combat. Now the Scots here also became, uh, came to be outflanked as the state paper, the Articles of the Bataille betwixt the King of Scots and the Earl of Surrey, uh, and the Earl of Surrey describes. It says that the Lord Howard, the Earl of Surrey, uh, caused his vanguard to sail in a little valley till the rearward were joined to one of the wings of his battle, and then both, uh, both lords in, the, in one front against the, the Scots, and they came down the hill and met them in good order. Now the text referencing flood and battlefield provide no better example to me of a number of issues regarding um, the impact of military terrain. Now perhaps Clausewitz's philosophy regarding uh, terrain as an obstacle to the approach was meant to be uh, in a, more in a more strategic manner, emphasising the approach to the battlefield itself. But Flodden, his theory also applies to a more tactical usage of the terrain during the battle. Um, and the groundwater at the foot of Branston Hill proved a hazard, um, a hidden hazard to an inexperienced army. We're going to uh, move back across the Scottish border now and uh, take a look at some of the Jacobite battles. Now for a very quick and basic explanation, uh, remember the Jacobites were supporters of the deposed Catholic King James VII and II and were fighting what they regarded to be the Protestant usurper King William III or, the William, or, or William of Orange. Now we're going to look at our very first Jacobite battle at Killiecrankie in Perthshire in 1689. Even though technically Killiecrankie had an inconclusive outcome due to the on-site death of the Jacobite leader, the Viscount Bonnie Dundee, uh, this doesn't detract uh, from a really interesting terrain feature which certainly helps the, uh, the Jacobite shock tactics. And we can take a look at this battle by bearing in mind Clausewitz's final category of terrain that provides cover from fire, as well as eyewitness accounts from the battle as well. 
Now, eyewitness accounts are brilliant examples of texts as artifacts, if you like. And of course, over the centuries, they do tend to become more common. One of the eyewitness accounts from Killiecrankie is Major General Mackay's memoir. Now, Mackay, as the principal military commander of the government forces, gives a, a very in-depth report of the battle uh, from his own perspective and goes through the engagement step by step. For instance, Mackay uh, gives us a description as to how the Jacobites occupied the ground of um, the high ground of Craig Yellow, a mountain, and shows his frustration of uh, their engagement on the hill, as uh, on the higher ground, as he says, Dundee had already got position uh, before we could be well up and had his back to a very high hill, which is the ordinary maxim of Highlanders, who never fight against regular forces upon anything of equal terms. Now this is something I can show you quite visually here with this uh, 1908 map from our NLS collections, which really gives us uh, some lovely detail of the contouring in and around the pass of Killiecrankie. Now the nature of the shock tactics of the Jacobite forces are somewhat different in style to the examples of warfare mentioned before. Um, at Killy Cranky, the Highland Charge of Gaelic origin was implemented, which was actually originally called an Irish Charge and had been utilised during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms earlier in the 17th century. However, the fundamental principles of the Charge uh, were much the same as Shiltrons and Pike Blocks uh, that we've previously talked about here. Um, the Charge also required a rapid advance and cohesion in the ranks, and this is something that became a classic Jacobite strategy at later battles, um, even, as, even as late as Preston Pans and Flodden. Um, but Dundee's positioning of his army on the lower terrace slopes of the mountain Craig Ellach, um, above Major General Mackay's men, created a significant topographic advantage for the Jacobite strategy, punching through the government lines at speed. Um, if we take a look at the photo of once again very professionally edited here on the left, um, we may be able to get an idea of how the terrace slope, slopes of Craig Yellow uh, provided the Jacobites with an advantage. Now, the, they charged these terraces, which gave them intermittent cover from government platoon firing as they disappeared from view. Now, this gave uh, the government soldiers very little chance to fire and reload their muskets, as this key line from an account written by the government soldier McBain reads. Only three rounds uh, could be fired before the Jacobites were upon us. But even though I've just taken a very short excerpt from McBain's text, it shows us how effective the use of the terrorist terrain was at Killiecrankie. Um, McBain's writing suggests a chaotic and panicky situation uh, for the government troops and is in fact also remarked upon by Mackay, as he states that the Highlanders are of such a quick motion that if a battalion keep, uh, keep up his fire till they be near to make sure of them, they are upon it before our men can come, uh, can come to, their se uh, to their second defence, which is the bayonet in the muzzle of the musket. In fact, uh, their line, uh, the government line resultantly broke very quickly, which would have been exacerbated by the single musket shot the Jacobites were notorious for delivering moments before the initial clash with the enemy. And this was to weaken lines and provide extra cover from the smoke of their firearms and giving the opposition very little time to aim and fire their, mus uh, uh, fire their muskets or fix their bayonets. The terrain at Killy Cranky suggests that when used intelligently, it can ultimately deal the outnumbered force the upper hand and it causes their enemies to swap tactics or to use that which deems their efforts useless. Um, we're going to uh, take a look at our final example now. We also have some key eyewitness accounts from other Jacobite battles as well. And the, I'm, I've taken the slightly lesser known 1719 uh, battle at Glen Shiel in Kintail, which gives us an even more extreme terrain to take a look at with regards to Jacobite tactics against the British government forces. As with numerous Jacobite battles, this encounter is quite the international affair with Spanish troops fighting on the Jacobite side. Um, the battle here is also the only Jacobite battle to not employ the aforementioned Highland charge tactic, as the Jacobites atypically didn't advance here and instead waited for the government to engage with them. As the difficult terrain uh, quote from Sun Tzu uh, relates to here on the slide, uh, one can only assume this is because the mountain slopes of Glen Shiel are far too uh, steep to charge down, and I can tell you that from personal experience as well. Um, if we take a look at this beautiful contemporary map by uh, John Henry Bastide, 
uh, you can see that the Jacobites and their supporters arranged themselves across both sides of this rather ruggedly steep glen. And the right flank stood on a, a knoll above the River Shield. And the Spanish arranged themselves slightly lower down the slopes and to the east of the Jacobite left. Uh, the government forces uh, came in and formed a line across the glen. Now I realise this might be a quite uh, small to see online, so I've pinpointed the army's starting positions and their illustrated movements across, uh, across the map as well. Um, to correspond with this map, in uh, Marshal Talibardin's letter to the Earl of Mar, the Jacobite, uh, he also writes, uh, we went about three miles from Glen Shiel to view the narrow passes in the Little Glen, hoping, hoping to maintain the rough ground till people that were expected should come up on the 7th. Now here he mentions the initial positioning of some of the Jacobite forces and also describes uh, the landscape in which they were preparing to fight, which as we can see from this photo is really quite tough terrain to navigate during an engagement. Now, the main issue with the Jacobite starting positions in such difficult ground is that the Jacobite left and right flanks and the Spanish forces had cut themselves off from each other physically, uh, quite physically, due to them positioning themselves on either side of the Glen and the River Shield. Now, as they had split their lines, perhaps in an attempt to surround the government forces, this actually hindered their plans. And Tullibardin continues um, that he uh, commanded in the centre uh, where he imagined the main attack would be. It, be, it being by far the easiest ground besides the only way through the glen. However, it happened other ways. The enemy placed their horse on the lower ground and a battalion on, uh, of them on their left, um, with their highlanders on the fair side of the right, all the rest of their foot was on a rising ground uh, to their right. Now, because the Jacobite forces had cut their lines off from one another and also had a much shorter range on their muskets than General Whiteman's government forces had with the grenades and the, co uh, and the cohort mortars uh, that were being fired, the Jacobites had no option here but to retreat up into the mountains of Glenshiel in stages, as their enemies did damage firstly to the Spanish forces to the east and to the Jacobite right as well, and then eventually outflanked their central and left positions as uh, the 1719 pro-government uh, ballad, a hymn to the victory in Scotland goes. Uh, yet when the battle it was done, uh, there was not frowned so much as one, none, none could tell which way they're gone. So this is suggesting now that the mountains perhaps provided the Jacobites forces with cover uh, during their retreat as well. Perhaps, at least for the Jacobites, uh, what this text shows is that their choice of landscape for an engagement was a poor one but at least for them, it was advantageous in their escape and eventual surrender with minimal casualties taking place that day. So we're pretty much out of time now really, but I hope um, I've managed to get across to you in this short talk just how useful so many different types of text can be in assisting our understanding of battlefield topography and in events that have kind of stood the test of time throughout Scottish history as well. I've used the military philosophy text here as a little guide as to what to look out for when you yourselves might uh, might be able to visit battlefields. And I have to say, when visiting any of these conflict sites, um, having read these texts myself, and especially the contemporary accounts from eyewitnesses, they certainly bring uh, the events to life and really help you visualise what happened in the surrounding environment. Now, of course, these texts are not always accurate, but what they can do is uh, they can be a really brilliant starting point in identifying how a commander who has considered their tactics in accordance with the ground can lead their uh, can lead their army to victory. So if you want to do a bit of further reading yourselves on the subject, I've just flashed up a short bibliography of some of the texts I've looked at here and some of the sources I've used. Um, some of them are available through the National Library of Scotland. The Winton Chronicles untranslated version is also available to see in our digital collections. And some of the maps I've shown are also available through our maps website as well.